Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2022 George Washington Leadership Lecture. I am Meg Nichols, the 23rd Regent of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. The association was founded in 1853 when they reached out to the nation and raised the funds to purchase Mount Vernon and save it from ruin. As the pioneering force behind the national preservation movement in America, the association has owned and operated Mount Vernon for the past 164 years uninterrupted. Did somebody say, oh boy, that's great? <laughs> It is. Our mission is twofold, preservation and educating the world about the life and legacy of our first and greatest president, George Washington. Before we get started, I would like to recognize and thank the vice regents who are here with us tonight. Ladies, thank you for all you do on behalf of the Mount Vernon cause. Will you please stand and be recognized? I would especially like to recognize and thank our Vice Regent for California, Mary Beth Borthwick, along with her husband, Hal, who unfortunately are not able to be with us tonight. Mary Beth is a University of Southern California alumna, and the Borthwick's generous gift allows this important partnership between Mount Vernon and the university to grow. Now in our ninth exciting year, this popular series, which we host in partnership, with the University of South Southern California's Saul Price School of Public Policy, explores George Washington's lifelong accomplishments, providing a better understanding of him as a man, as well his as his remarkable leadership, professional achievement, and lasting legacy. Please join me in a round of thanks for Mary Beth and the Borthwicks. I also want to thank each one of you who are here tonight with us for your continued support of Mount Vernon throughout the year. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. David Sloan, who will bring greetings from the University of Southern California. Good evening. And indeed I welcome you uh, to this George Washington Leadership Lecture in the name of the entire Saul Price School of Public Policy, especially our dean, um, our new dean, uh, Dana Goldman, who was unable to attend this event. The Price School highly values the partnership with the Ladies Association. It's been a great uh, series for us, and we thank very much the Vice Regent from California, Mary Beth Borthwick, we just got thanks, so I'm not going to go too far with that. Um, we are particularly in love this. We particularly value this lecture series over other lecture series because it brings together two very seemingly opposing things and bring and makes them complementary. So you have George Washington, who's a famous iconic figure in American history. And you have a public policy school founded in 1929 and concerned about today, the contemporary world. And so the lecture series has been from its beginning, the uh, uh, has been from its beginning, the attempt to try and understand contemporary public policy issues through the lens of the life and accomplishments of George Washington. Tonight is special in many ways in addition, first, we get to see the new film discussing Washington and the early efforts to define religious freedom in the new nation. And we have the opportunity to hear about the remarkable career of Congressman Frank Wolf, especially his many efforts to support religious freedom around the world. Finally, like the Regent, I'd like to thank you for coming. One of the things that's been most wonderful about the nine years that we've done this, and I've done all nine of them, is, is you. The questions you ask, the participation you give, the, the, the attention that you give to this. 
It makes this special event even more special for the speakers and those viewing here and online. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David Sloan. I appreciate that. And Madam Regent, and I agree to welcome all of you here as well. I'm Doug Bradburn, President and CEO of George Washington Mount Vernon, and I have been here for all nine of these as well, David. And I know that uh, I'm sure the pictures from that event would be hard to distinguish from the pictures of this event if we looked at them closely. You and I haven't changed at all in these nine years. But it has been an incredible journey and always a chance to learn a lot. The Saul Price School has a great mission statement, which is to make the world a better place. And you can't find a better mission than that. So we are deeply honored to partner with you as well. And I would encourage anybody when you're in Southern California to check out their extraordinary jewel of a campus right there in the middle of the urban jungle. It really is a spectacular place for people to learn. Now, uh, this uh, lecture series, as we've said, has really been around since the Library of Mount Vernon was open, the Washington Library open, and I'm happy to say next year will be our 10-year anniversary of that library, so I look forward to an exciting year. Uh, yeah, we can have an applause line there. <laughs> applause, flashing. And it's going to be an exciting year, it, and it fits very well with the mission of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, because we all remember that it was George Washington himself in his first inaugural and in his farewell address, who pointed out that knowledge is in every company, every country, uh, the most secure blessing for public happiness. And a country that governs itself needs to be educated. Because, and I will paraphrase here, an uneducated polity will make bad policy. And so I'm happy to say tonight, uh, you'll see an example of one of the educational movies that Mount Vernon has been producing you know, since that library opened. This is our fourth in a series of movies. And they are short movies designed to be used by teachers to help explain complex topics to students in a way that then teachers can use to draw out students and, and, and pursue the topic more fully. Uh, they are short. Uh, gone are the days when the teacher would roll out the projector and you'd sit back for 50 minutes and go on to your next class. These are intended to be seen and talked about in the class. And like all of our educational resources at Mount Vernon, they are free for teachers to use all over the country. And this particular film, like all of our films, uh, is surrounded by other materials that teachers can use. And I will say in the time that we're in now, uh, where history is political and uh, teachers don't necessarily know where to go to get the materials to teach in their classes, mountvernon.org is a trustworthy webpage where you know you're not going to be bombarded with somebody's particular ideology and rather can get to the history as it was. And we, we pride ourselves uh, that uh, that website has been recognized and these films have been recognized, each one we've made, one on the Battle of Yorktown, one on uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware, one on the making of the Constitution called the More Perfect Union, have all won uh, gold, silver telly awards, which is the highest award for educational filmmaking available in the United States. So tonight you're going to see the premiere at Mount Vernon of our fourth movie on religious freedom. And, and so for all of the limitations of the framers uh, of the Constitution and the founders of the United States to create what we would consider a, a democracy, uh, their different ideas about race, about gender, about class, certainly not uh, where 21st century enlightened folks like ourselves would want them to be, in religious freedom, in fact, they are exceptional uh, and further along than any nation in the world at the time, and in many cases, any nation, many nations today, which we're going to hear a little bit about. So the way this evening will go, uh, we're going to see the movie shortly, and then uh, David and I are going to have a brief conversation about religious freedom and the founding or any questions he might have about the film uh, David Sloan himself is, of course, a professor of history, so we can't get anything by him in his discriminating eye, although his undergraduate degree, I think, is in poli sci, so we'll, we'll have to... Uh... Okay, all right. Um, history all the way. All right. And then, uh, and then I, I want to give our a, a great introduction to the main event of the night, uh, 
the Honorable Frank Wolf, who served in the U.S. House of Representatives for 34 years, representing Virginia's 10th district, right? Let's hear it for Frank Wolf. Absolutely. Now, he is the author of the International Religious Freedom Act, which infused religious freedom into U.S. foreign policy in the 1990s, Frank, right? That act. Uh, he also authored the legislation to create a special envoy at the U.S. State Department to advocate for religious minorities in the Near East and South Central Asia. He's a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, recently appointed to that bipartisan commission. Wolf founded and served as the co-chairman of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, a bipartisan organization made up of nearly 200 members of Congress who worked together to raise awareness about international human rights issues. He's traveled to Ethiopia, Sudan, Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Rwanda, and other countries in Africa to see firsthand the tremendous suffering due to corrupt government, war, AIDS, and famine. Following his retirement from Congress, Wolf was appointed the first ever Wilson Chair in Religious Freedom at Baylor University. The recent update in 2016 of the International Religious Freedom Legislation was named the Frank Wolf International Religious Freedom Act, which was passed unanimously, if you can believe that. So David will interview Congressman Wolf to help us better understand the ongoing work around that the United States is engaged in to help religious minorities and establish the ideals of religious freedom around the world. Ideals that you'll see from our film are infused into the very beginning of the shared values that Americans have. In many cases, we often take for granted. So without further ado, let's go and get the premiere of George Washington and the Pursuit of Religious Freedom. to sign the Oath of Allegiance. That's correct. It is March 1754. A young lieutenant colonel is brought before his superiors and presented with a document. I do declare that there is no transubstantiation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It is a vow rejecting the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Or in the elements of bread and wine at or after the consecration. With war constant England Lieutenant Colonel George Washington would then depart with his regiment to fight for the British Empire. It's all harder, sir. But in time, he would come to be Britain's great adversary and the great champion of religious freedom. Religious faith provides personal connection to morals that shape beliefs and societies. But for most of human history, there was no separation between church and state. Most governments required everyone to follow a single religion, and those who did not were persecuted. Religious wars plagued much of the world for centuries. Protestants were excommunicated by ruling Catholics. Catholics were martyred where Protestants ruled. Jews were demonized, expelled, and dispersed. For many of these unfortunates, North America was a chance to begin again. When the English established their first colony in Virginia in 1607, they brought the Church of England with them. In 1620, a group of pilgrims arrived at Plymouth. Maryland was founded by Roman Catholics. America's first Jews settled in what became New York City. Quakers chartered Pennsylvania. Enslaved Africans carried with them a variety of religious traditions. Across two centuries, North America became a patchwork for many existing faiths and religious practices and sparked the creation of new ones. In this society.
love of God. We have passed laws in this colony. Your teachings dilute our values. Many who sought religious freedom in the colonies did not tolerate religious difference. They saw the New World as a place to perfect their own form of worship and often persecuted those who practiced differently. New Englanders based laws on the Bible. Catholics barred Protestants from holding office until the Protestants gained power and barred the Catholics. Jews were forbidden from holding office everywhere. Native American religious practices were brutally suppressed. In this world, nearly every aspect of life could be regulated by the church. In George Washington's Virginia, the Anglican Church was the established state religion. Raised in a deeply religious home, he was a devout Anglican and served as a parish leader. All inhabitants were required to pay taxes to support Anglican ministers, including the growing numbers of dissenters, including Presbyterians and Baptists. People could be fined if they did not attend services. The only legal marriages were those performed by a minister of the Church of England. As a member of the colonial vestry, George Washington helped enforce these rules. If you were in the religious minority, often your only liberty was the freedom to go elsewhere. And many did. The colonies and their diversity of faiths would prove increasingly difficult to control by the distant British Empire and the Church of England. In 1776, men who worshipped differently came together and declared that, under the laws of nature and of nature's God, the 13 colonies were When Washington takes command of the Continental Army, he's given the task to make real the bold claims of the Declaration of Independence. But it was a daunting challenge. The army was a motley collection of strangers from different cultures and regions and different religious expectations. It was a complex issue of leadership. How do you discipline and organize an army when they have a diversity of religious practices? How do you encourage moral behavior while not requiring a uniformity of belief? On the one hand, his approach was traditional. Washington ensured that there were chaplains available and required soldiers attended services when they could. But also innovated. He embraced the religious diversity of the army. He made a point of worshiping with different denominations. On religious holidays, Washington sought amity. He emphasized the similarities across the diverse religions of his soldiers. And he regularly ordered the army to give thanks to a benign providence. The war proved to Washington that people of different beliefs can achieve together in pursuit of a common cause. Men so different from him had fought with valor and served with loyalty. He saw their goodness and dedication, and he needed them. The victory at Yorktown in 1781 affirmed the success of Washington's leadership. The achievement of American independence proved the truth of the Declaration and opened up possibilities to reimagine a new republic. that independence could not have been won without the support of people of many faiths. The Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, written by Thomas Jefferson, 
severed all connections between church and state. But these rights were not guaranteed in all states. 1787 saw the creation of the Constitution and a new federal government. But how would this new government affect the diverse religious practices across the 13 states? Would all Americans be able to worship as they please? Elected unanimously as the individual rights. Washington noted, We should never again see religious disputes carried to such a pitch as to endanger the peace of society. That would be the challenge. Could there be national unity without religious uniformity? As the new president, Washington made it a priority to visit communities across the United States to understand the concerns of the American people. At each stop, he received petitions from political leaders, business groups, religious communities, fraternal organizations, and others. Each congratulated Washington on his election and made requests of the new government. Few were as concerned about religious freedom as America's Jewish citizens. The first Jews had sought refuge throughout the Americas after years of by 1790, there had been Jewish communities in North America for over a century. Despite anti-Semitism and efforts at expulsion, still, they remained a vulnerable minority. By the time of Washington's inauguration, they numbered a few thousand in a nation of more than three million Christians. On August 17th, On behalf of his congregation, he delivered a petition which expressed their hope that Jewish people could safely practice their religion and would be treated as full citizens. Washington replied with a letter to the congregants of the Turo Synagogue. He hoped that Jewish citizens would find goodwill and safety in the United States. Washington expressed aspiration that the federal government be based on freedom of conscience, not simply religious tolerance. He proclaimed that it is now no more that toleration is spoken of, as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. This was a revolutionary statement. Washington's letter concluded powerfully by agreeing with Moses Satius' words that the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Mr. Mason, do you believe we could see six to eight copies of this by the day after tomorrow for our charter members to look over as well? Such a clear statement of the values of the new nation before the passage of the First Amendment to the Constitution played a critical role in solidifying the trends towards religious freedom. In the first two years of his presidency, Washington responded to at least 18 religious communities in a similar manner, assuring each that they were safe and free to practice their religion. See, so what this is his words were printed in newspapers throughout the country and even echoed across the Atlantic. Thomas Paine, who was in Paris in support of the French Revolution, quoted at length of Washington's letter to the Society of Quakers that the law should reflect freedom of conscience. Washington's assurances were affirmed with the 1791 ratification of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed to all citizens that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion 
or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Religious freedom was now enshrined in the fundamental law of the United States. And all the other freedoms of the First Amendment, of speech, of the press, of petition and assembly, stem from the notion that the state does not have a monopoly on the truth, and that the government should not control the rights of individuals to follow their conscience. Since Washington, American presidents have maintained the tradition of extending goodwill to faiths around the world. We are still striving. Today, the establishment of religious freedom remains relevant. It is a value that all Americans should share, and it ought to be emulated around the world. When George Washington said farewell to the nation, he reminded the people that there would always be a place for religion in American life, but that people should never live in fear of being prevented from practicing their religion. In concluding his letter to the people of the Turo Synagogue, Washington expressed the hope that the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness upon our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy. <clears throat> Hi, wasn't that fun? Really great movie, I thought. I think it was spectacular. <laughs> Unbelievable. Jeez. It's a cheap night out for most of you here. That's uh... So, Doug Bradburn. Yes. I really enjoyed the film. I was struck when Washington made a distinction between conscience and tolerance. Mm. Yeah. As as an historian, we aren't going to just he, paraphrasing. We're just going to tolerate the existence of a diverse religious population. Right. We're going to celebrate it. How did Washington's view on religious freedom fit with his views on democracy? Do you think? Well, uh, that's a really great insight because that that is the revolutionary difference between uh, where you might see a diversity of religions allowed to exist together in a in a pluralistic way in the early modern era say like amsterdam or something where you have different faiths all together in a city uh and they they were allowed to practice but they were tolerated uh with the sense that the the jews in newport were tolerated they were allowed to practice but the difference in the american revolutionary context is the idea that you have a natural right to you have a right to practice and it isn't up to anybody else to tolerate you but it's your fundamental freedom of conscience. It's your right to be able to do that. And that that's a critical way Americans have thought about uh, citizenship and how it's, how it's different from subjecthood. You might have privileges granted to you by a king that allows you to have your small community together. It's very different from the idea of American citizenship based on rights of individuals to have a freedom of conscience. And, and that, that's, that's, you know, that, that's the key switch that you see there. Um, you know, and you, you start immediately, you have uh, Jews elected to Congress. There's no test in the Constitution. We, we didn't get to see the very beginning of the film. Uh, heads will roll, no doubt. But uh, what, what happened in the context of the British Empire, to be an officer in the army or to be a magistrate, a JP, to be elected, George Washington and every officer in the British Empire had to make an oath, a test oath, that the Pope was antichrist, that they didn't believe in transubstantiation, the Catholic, they had a, you know, and, and the ascendancy of the Hanoverians in Britain. It was all part of that. The politics and religion was wound in. And he would go on to help found a country in which no one would ever have to take an oath like that to hold office. And that, that's a, 
at the time, that was an incredibly revolutionary transformation. So you got your finger on that. And I think that also gets to your second question about his notion of, you know, uh, democracy is sort of an anachronistic word for the 18th century, but certainly a, a, a government in which the people ruled, in which there was popular sovereignty, uh, in which liberty would be a characteristic of society, you know, which of course gets us towards the direction of what we think of as democracy. And so Washington very much believed that that had to be an essential part of it, that the state does not dictate, you know, the kinds of beliefs people need to have before they can serve. Uh, it's it, almost like the consciousness is both religious and civic. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Because the key, the key thing is in a, in a monarchical society where there's a divine right to rule, uh, the, the king is responsible for the truth the religious truth the, yeah. and to have to enforce that religious truth. And in the American system, they separate that idea that the state has a monopoly on truth, which of course leads to all our incredible disagreements with each other um, because there's not one person saying you, this is the truth, but that's where the idea of freedom of press and freedom of speech and, and really the vibrancy of our political system comes from that you have that all these different people they have a right to express their opinion. And, uh, so we, you know, and that that's so different from a world in which the king and the church are, are, are you know, they're they're putting people in prison for blasphemy all the time um, because they'll say things that are what we would consider today political. But they're essentially, you know, they're they're um, they're blasphemous. They're heretical yeah. as well. We were reminded um, very recently with the death of Queen Elizabeth about that connection between church and state. Mm. Right? I mean, basically, Charles becomes king through the church. That's right. And yeah. it, it is a remarkable change from one society to another, both viewed now as great democracies. Yeah, I think, and the willingness, um, obviously, they've taken a different path than, than we have to get to a similar place. Um, but that... Um, that willingness to to take the risk of saying that you don't need to have a state church. Right. I mean, the, the the movie can't tell the whole story. I mean, all the different states after independence have sort of different rules. Virginia is kind of really radical with the the uh, the Virginia statute of religious freedom mentioned here. But like South Carolina did an interesting thing in the immediate aftermath. They had two established churches, so they had Presbyterian, and Anglican. Those were the legal churches. Everything else was illegal. You know, and in Massachusetts, you had a situation where each town could have, you know, the official right. church, congregationalist town of the church. And then maybe you might have two, the splits there. But even those states like Connecticut and Massachusetts into 1820 and 1830, they still had a legal establishment. And the interesting thing about Article, you know, the, the First Amendment is Congress shall make no law affecting the establishment of religion. That means they can't they can't go in and change the one in Connecticut. Uh, either right, so right. it's uh, you know it's it, it's the, the the nature of our 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 federal system in that sense, and so it was a you know it was a sort of halting conversation about what is the relationship between the state and the people. And the people. But Washington is really on the side uh, of uh, what we would you think of of, uh, of the direction that the country is going to go in, and it's critical as president of this new country to go around the nation saying that, you know, everyone can worship as they please under the system, that this yeah. new government is not going to come in with all sorts of rules that are going to change the way you're used to doing it. It's a, it's a critical thing in the way presidents, we think of it nowadays as the bully pulpit, but presidents yeah. express the aspirations of what a country can be. And that's what we're seeing with Washington. Yeah. Uh, the letter to the Turo Synagogue is, a you know, anybody who, like uh, Doug and I as historians, it's like one of those iconic moments and I went back and read the last part of it because of what you put it up here. Yeah. And I have to say that I had forgotten it ended with the word happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which just struck me as, you know, we, when we think of, of religious freedom, we think of more moral, uh, we think of uh, more ethical, we think of somehow more spiritual, mm -hmm. not happy. Yeah. And it's an intriguing use of the word. Well, remember you know? our, our pursuit rights of happiness, and the declaration, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? The pursuit of happiness. I mean, the the idea of happy, it's an it's a 
you know, it's coming out of kind of Scottish moral philosophy and enlightenment if you really want to get deep into it. But I, I think it oh, resonates. Don't. No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> apologies to uh, the University of Edinburgh. But uh, it speaks, I think, to the notion that this is a country where people will be free to be themselves, to yeah. pursue their conscience and, and make a life for themselves and not have to be oppressed by you know the the state in that in that fundamental way and that's certainly you know an aspect of the liberty side of the of the liberating trends of the american revolutionary era which yeah. is uh which was unique um we're always looking you know americans fight over whether we're exceptional as a nation and not there's many ways we're not exceptional every nation's exceptional in some ways but really in our um defining of the separation of church and state and creating an idea of a complicated large polity in which you could let people worship as they please that was extraordinary in the time and as we know and you'll talk to frank about it's still extraordinary in many still places around, around the world and it is a legacy i don't think that we're teaching particularly well in school um and i do think uh i don't think i mean you and i know about the Turo letter i don't think it's widely known and it's not something washington is often associated with and his his leadership and and so i think by taking his personal biography as a man who at one point in his life was making an oath that the Pope is Antichrist so that he can have a job. At the end of his life, you know, it helps create a country that has a new vision for how we, how we can be together. That's a really powerful way to speak to uh, our rising generation of leaders, our, our kids. No, I, I have you to know. say, I, I thought the movie was very no, important you. because we've seen a lot of Religious Red, issues and anti-Semitism, rising anti-Semitism, stuff, astonishing yeah. stuff. And my, you know, when we thought this stuff was gone, uh, and the vandalism and the and murders, and even in this country, uh, yeah, it's it's um, it, it is re it's incredibly relevant, and these stories need to be told, and not always told by the Anti-Defamation League. I mean, they got to come from right. places like Mount Vernon. They got to come, you know, from places where you, you're you're cheating about George Washington, who doesn't have some radical agenda. This is a fundamental value that has been a part of what makes us a nation since the beginning. It's not some newfangled thing. And we're at a moment in our history where we need to find the things that we agree on. And I would say 90% of Americans agree on the idea of freedom of religion and conscience. We fight over particular aspects of policy. We fight over particular ways that's going to manifest itself, you know, in, in daily life. Yep. But, but I think generally that is a, a value we share. I think that's a nice place to leave it. Okay, good. Well, let's get Frank Wolf up here. Thank you, David. Thank you, sir. You cut me off. Thank you, sir. Congressman. Thank you, sir. Professor. So I thought we would start with your thoughts on the film. It's a great film. I saw it one other time uh, when I first was in invited, and I've, I've been up to the synagogue up in Rhode Island, and and I read uh, President Washington's words. I think it's a wonderful film and should be seen. And I agree, I think you said, I think uh, uh, George Washington's uh, picture should be in every school. All right, so moving on from the film, unless you have a no, specific, yeah, I, I wanna use our time uh, carefully here because you and you and I and Doug had a conversation on the phone that went like an hour and we don't have an hour. So I want to get to some of the stuff that we can get to. I thought we'd start with um, how it started for you in your trip to Ethiopia during the famine and how that was an awakening for you about issues in the world around freedom. Well, well, thank you for coming, and I'm pleased to be here. My first trip to Mount Vernon was in 1955, and a class trip from John Bartram High School in the city of Philadelphia, and I've been back many times. So thank you. I'm, I'm honored uh, to be given this up, up opportunity. I had never been out of the country before I got elected to Congress, except once I was one day in Canada. And uh, when the, my best friend in Congress was a Democratic congressman, Congressman Tony Hall, We've been in a small fellowship, a small Bible study together for years, and we still are. So it's it's gone on for well over 40, 40 years. He's my best friend, and we do everything thing together. He called me on the phone and said, uh, Wolf, there's a famine taking place in Ethiopia. Uh, you got to go. He had just gotten back. 
And I called Sil Conte. I had just gotten on the appropriations committee. And I said, Mr. Conte, can I? He said, go if you want to. And I went. I got waylaid in, a, in, a, uh, in Addis Ababa. I couldn't get up to the area. Uh, actually, the Washington Post did a story on me saying that I was eating pizza uh, in the Hilton. And I was because Ethiopia was, as you know, one time controlled by, by Italy. I finally got on an airplane by World Vision. I went up. We went up to Coram. Uh, we went on but at Alamata. What I saw was uh, people dying, uh, 50,000 on a, a plane up in Coram. And uh, I said uh, to the, can I spend the night? And a young man said, you can sleep in my tuchel. And I spend the night and storms came and we were not able to get out there for a couple of days. And so what I saw uh, changed, changed, changed me. Before that time, I was interested in I-66 bringing Metro out. Uh, different things like that, uh, that, that, that changed me. And then uh, Tony Hall took me to uh, Romania in 1985. It was Congressman Chris Smith and Tony Hall and myself. It was darker in Romania than it was in Moscow. Ceausescu was brutal. And uh, th saw the persecution, the persecution of the Jewish faith, persecution of the Catholic. We met with Bishop Robo and we met all the... And so those two things changed my whole... Uh, thrust and mine and things. And so those two trips, had I not taken those two trips, uh, I don't know what, if I would have been interested in it. Huh. It's an amazing thing. Travel changes us all. Certainly has had that impact upon me. Um, one of the things that came out of that much later was the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, of which you were a crucial part in have, making that occur. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the commission? Talk about how it works, who's who's who the who the fellows are, and what kinds of issues that you're struggling with right now sure. as the, a member. Sure, the, the, the commission is bipartisan. Uh, uh, we are split 50-50, but we get along very very well. Uh, the speaker gets some appointments. Leader McCarthy, I'm Leader McCarthy's appointment. Uh, Mitch McConnell gets an appointment. Uh, Schumer gets, get, gets an appointment. Uh, President Biden get, get, gets an appointment. It's to look at the whole issue of international religious freedom around the world. And it is to be a sort of a truth teller. As many of you know, in the, in the administration, they may not, any administration, they not want to do the issue because somebody will say, well, we're trading with them or we're doing that or we have a base. So it sets up an office of international religious freedom in the State Department, and that, but also you serve as the commission to be a truth teller, to be able to say, you know, that's not right. It, it, in spite of what we're getting, oil or whatever, we should be speaking out. We should be speaking out for the people of Nigeria, where Boko Haram and the girls have been taken away. No matter what the oil is, no matter what, we should be speaking out. So it's kind of a truth teller, and it works closer together, and it there's language calling the countries of CPC, countries of particular con concern. And so we were we were meeting yesterday up on the hill asking for Nigeria to designate them as a CPC country, to have a special envoy, to have like, uh, God bless George Bush, he appointed Senator John Danforth to be the special envoy in, in Sudan to do the same thing for Ni Nigeria. So it's to bring together and we have we have two rabbis, we have a, we have a minister, we have uh, people that worked up on the hill. We have David Carey, who's had a, a open doors. But the commission has a, a great staff, and there are there are no arguments. Doesn't mean we always agree, but we have come together, and it's been really very very powerful. And how did that happen? Do you think why why is it just that the appointees worked out really well, or is the structure, or is it the people that really are committed to the issue? Well, I think hopefully the, the administration people, Republican and Democrat, are all going to put people that care deeply about this issue. Uh, and so I can't go back in the past. There have been some differences. I know years ago uh, when, when it first started, but it has been really a blessing. I, have, I, 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 I told Tony the other day, I, here, here's people who have nothing in common politically can sit down and break. I think breaking bread with one another can help a little, but really get along. So I, 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 but we get along very, very well. It's a great staff. It's it's a small staff, but it makes a big impact because many of the countries and groups will come to us and say, 
you know, the State Department won't help us, would you? And when they advocate and we put out a report every year that calls things the way they really are. And what is the latest part of that report? Well, the latest, the 22, the latest one is coming out, will become out in January, February, or March. We're looking at it now. For instance, we just did a, a major uh, a re review of the textbooks in Egypt. Uh, Egypt, the anti Semitism. I was in Egypt in 2014, and I met with the leader of the Jewish community. And keep in mind, there used to be 50 to 80,000, the population, the Jewish population of Egypt. And I said to her, ma'am, how many Jewish people are left? She said, Mr. Wolf, maybe 20, 25. In our report, there is anti-Semitism, and the Jewish population now of Egypt is down to three. And we have given Egypt 70,000, 70 billion, billion dollars. And if we can't get anti-Semitism out of their textbooks, so we are looking at their textbooks. There's anti-Christian language against the Coptic, Coptic Christians. So we look at things like, like that and speak out truth. Now, different lobbies in town say, oh, well, it's really good. Well, if you can't get Egypt after giving them $70 billion to take out anti-Semitic language that's in there, an anti-Coptic Christian, then so that's what we're looking at now. And we will call for them. We're also looking at putting... Nigeria back on a country particularly concerned, but yeah. it's to find issues and many of the groups who are being persecuted of all faiths. I mean, right now in China, every denomination, they come to us because they think we will be an advocate for them. So let's talk a little bit about China. The commission's chair, Nuri Turkle, was born in a re-education camp for Uyghurs in China. The plight of the Uyghurs has been widely debated in the U.S., both in public and in private. Yet the nation, we as a nation, seem to have little success in changing Chinese policy or affecting how the Chinese view the Uyghurs. What has to be done to make this situation improve? Well, situate every every group, every faith group in China is being persecuted. I've adopted on the commission, uh, Colonel Zinn. Colonel Zinn is a 90-year-old Catholic colonel who would come by my, my office, and I've adopted him, and I'm advocating for him. They have charged him. He's 90 years old, and if he's convicted, a jail sentence for, I mean, I'm 83, a jail sentence for me, a 90-year-old man. And so there are five Catholic bishops that are being persecuted. There's some that are underground church. The Protestant church are hundreds of Protestant, Protestant pastors. Tibet, I slipped into Tibet back in the 90s. There's cultural genocide in every monastery. It's like in my church, being a Presbyterian church, it'd be like having a security police in, 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 in my church. The Uyghurs, though, there are two to three million in these camps. Uh, I was a good friend of Reba Kadir, who was related to, to, to him. Is related to, to him. They, they are treating the Uyghurs I don't want to get too graphic, but next to every Uyghur camp, there's a crematorium. And what they're doing is they're taking their organs out. There have been 60 to 75,000, and Nori's family is there. And Nori, God, God bless him, has been advocating for him. It's been, uh, I don't want to say anything controversial to tonight, but one of the difficulties that I've seen is in these Uyghur camps, crematoriums, the stories that I talked to some of the Uyghurs who escape, there are cameras. And those cameras are made by a company called Hickvision. Hickvision has lobbyists here in Washington, D.C. During the Carter administration or the Reagan administration, no one would have ever represented the Soviet Union. And now, so... I think we have to speak out. We have to be 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 bold. Uh, there is a group that we're working with to maybe bring some suits. There are some American groups. I'm not going to mention it. There are groups that are working, training the Chinese doctors for organs, and and the Hudson Institute has put it together. So I think we have to speak out boldly. President, when, when I saw the film, it brought out again. President Reagan 
uh, I grabbed Reagan's coattails. I, I, I lost in 76 and I lost in 78. And a fellow came in and said he was a precinct chairman for me in, in 78. Thank you for doing that. Uh, if it hadn't been for Ronald Reagan, I would have never gotten elected. I was a government employee. I quit my, my job. Reagan said that the words in the Constitution and the words in the Declaration of Independence were a covenant, not only with the people in Philadelphia in, in 1776 and 1787, but a covenant with the entire world. Reagan was right. We need to boldly speak out. And these groups, when you go, whether you go to Sierra Leone, whether you go to Sudan, whether you go to Rwanda, they they always look to us. So I think we, we need to speak out and be very, very bold. I think there should be legal cases brought. I think there should be a law prohibiting anyone from lobbying for a group that's involved in the genocide of the weaker. So there is so much that we can do, but the moral leadership, and if you saw, you know, in this answer, the UN Human Rights Council two days ago voted 19 to 17 not to investigate this, not to, not to, not to look at it, because the economic power that, that, that China has. So I think America has to always be speaking out, speaking out and pushing, bringing up the UN, putting embargoes on and speaking. But lately, it just doesn't seem to be that that's really happening en uh, enough. So let's deviate from that for a second, because one of the stories you told that I found most compelling was that you went to Afghanistan right essentially right after 9-11. I did. I, I, uh, I uh, asked the administration, would they let me go? And they said no. So uh, I talked to Tony Hall and Joe Pitts. Joe was a member of Congress from uh, Pens Pennsylvania. We were in this small group together and we said, we're going to go. So what we did is we said we were going to go to Pakistan and that trip was approved. In Pakistan, we jumped on a world food program plane and we flew into Afghanistan. We met with President Karzai. We met, we talked, and we saw it. We went into the schools where we saw what was taking place. We talked to the women who told us of the uh, the burqa and, and the beaten by the Taliban. And so I think that's, yeah, we saw it and it, and we see what's taking place now. It's very, uh, people who work for us have been left behind women are going through a very difficult time schools are going through a very difficult time and uh, but yes we did we uh, we we went in so in one of those stories that's uh, both incredibly tragic and potentially a sign of hope a neighbor of afghanistan iran has uh, this extraordinary <laughs> circumstance where this young woman masha Amini is uh, killed by the police for wearing her hijab imp improperly. And that has led to this just extraordinary outburst of, of anger um, throughout, throughout the country, apparently. And you have specific views on why Iran is a threat to religious freedom and to potentially freedom and political freedom as well. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? I, I do. I, I One, it's, it's a 22-year-old woman who had the courage in Iran. And and Yusuf is doing, we're doing, we have a podcast out on it, just came, came out. Uh, she, she, she took her hijab off. If you want to wear a hijab, you ought to be able to wear them anywhere. In Dayton, Ohio, in Philadelphia, in Iran, wherever, but if you don't want to wear one, and the fact is she has done that, and now you've had almost the latest surveys, 20, about 2,000, about 220 people have been killed, many, many young people. The women of Iran are literally leading this thing. This is, this is, this is, uh, uh, Many uh, we're hearing comments that you know their their families don't don't know they go out at night they go to these riots and and, and some are doing things and they're picked up and they, what took the place to that young woman uh, she was apparently was beaten uh, over the over the over the head I think uh, we need to do some things like this one I think we should 
break down the firewall of the inner internet. They're now controlling the internet so that people cannot get it. If you find they're having a very difficult time, there are ways for our people to break down the firewall of the internet that we can go directly to them. Secondly, I, I, I think we need to end uh, the nuclear talks. I think for they want that so badly. And for the very thought that that group Khomeini and them would have nuclear weapons, particularly at this time. So we should we should withdraw, certainly for the pirate when this is taking place. You you really can't be talking to the Iranian government at the very time they're killing these 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 young people. Thirdly, I would think I think it, it's it's very delicate because we don't want to say something that then puts the people who are standing up for human rights and religious freedom and every group every group in Iran is being persecuted. Uh, they did a cartoon. Uh, their Holocaust did deniers last last year. The Sufis are being persecuted. The Baha'is are being pers persecuted. Uh, a large number are, are becoming Christians. They're being persecuted. Sunnis are being per persecuted. But it doesn't, we don't want to look like Uncle Sam is coming in. I would love to see four women in, a, in America, maybe a, a, a member of Congress, a Republican woman and a Democratic woman, some younger ones that can sort of identify and maybe the most prominent spokesman, a woman, to talk directly to the people in Iran. I believe this could literally be the time that the government falls. And if there are some stories that we hear where some of the parents are telling the kids, we participated in the revolution demonstrations against the Shah and look what happened. Now, this may very well be the thing that brings down the Iranian government. We owe it to the Iranian people. And I'll tell you, as a father of four daughters and, and, and one, one son, I think the women and the young women particularly have really, I mean, it's been amazing because the morality police, many are dying and many know that if they're taken away to prison, uh, they may not be seen for a long, long period of time. But I think there's something the West needs to do, but not do it in a way that it's it's America, but it's the West and young women who are of the same age speaking directly and break down the internet firewall so we can direct them to them. I think the failure for us several years ago for speaking out on the Green Revolution, I think there's an opportunity now. I think there's an opportunity now for freedom and religious freedom for the people of Iran and the good people. I, have a, I had a large Iranian population that was in my district, out in Southern California. There's a large number. There are great citizens. I think there's an opportunity for freedom in Iran. We have a very, we are very fortunate to have a very substantial number of Iranians, uh, Persians who come to the to USC. Um, I'm going to turn to you in a minute and ask you to ask questions, which I think we're, we're uh, Stephen, we're getting questions, right? Uh, that everybody should have a card and just write that down and give it to Stephen and Stephen will ask the question. And if you're online live streaming, you can also ask a question, I believe, and Stephen will bring that to us. I'm going to come back to Nigeria while we begin to just to give it, because, you know, the Boko Haram thing is just heartbreaking. Um, but if I could twist it, just uh, if I could tweak this just a little, um, there's a man named Mubarak Bala, who's an atheist. And the commission has written about him, I thought, very effectively. And he's being hounded, uh, arrested, and others, because in some sense, being an atheist is viewed as an illegal attack upon the Muslim state. Correct. And it's in this interesting thing about religious freedom is can one be religiously free and not be religious? And how do we as a society or how do societies around the world that are deeply, deeply religious, right? Like Nigeria, like Iran, like other places that are deeply religious, how do they handle people who don't fit with that, because they could be people who are don't practice a faith. A faith they may not even believe in faith. 
Well, uh, uh, Fred, Fred Davey, who was on our coup commission, I, I believe has adopted the prisoner of conscience. Uh, Fred is a Democrat appointed by uh, uh, Senator Schumer and, and went to Nigeria several, several, several months ago. And Fred, I believe, has adopted him. The Nigerian yep. situation is so difficult. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa. They have 210 million people. In 2050, they will have more people in Nigeria than we have in America. They're good people. I mean, I, they're some of the finest people. There's a large diaspora. We have probably 500,000 yep. or more that live here in, in, in the United States. My Lyft driver today. Yeah, yeah. You have fundamentally a corrupt government. And so goes the Buhari government gets a lot of money from us. The previous administration called them a, a country of particular concern. This administration has taken them off, but there's a, there's a meeting. Uh, Secretary Blinken, the delegate, uh, the members of the meeting, asking him to put them back to CPC and appoint a special envoy who will go to bring in all these things. But the Boko Haram, 40% of the girls, and I met with some of their mothers, 40% of the girls, again, have not returned. The world did hashtag bring back our girls, but uh, there's a there's the girls a, didn't come back. A, a, another prisoner of conscience that I've adopted is a young Christian girl, Shia, uh, Leah, Leah Sherbo. Leah was kidnapped at age 14 and would not deny her faith, and she's 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 gone. This Boko Haram has committed genocide officially. It's it meets the definition. The Fulani militants have committed genocidal activity. And now uh, uh, Professor Isis is, is is now moving in. I think we need uh, President Bush appointed, if you recall, uh, Senator John Danforth, who was a uh, who actually was a, a Episcopalian uh, pastor, great great man. He was a senator from uh, uh, Missouri as a special envoy yep. to be an advocate for the Southern Sud Sudan issue. What we need basically is a someone like that to be a special envoy, somebody that President Biden feels closely to, somebody that he feels comfortable with, uh, that to be our envoy to go over there and put pressure on the Buhari government so people can be atheist, not believe, can be, and, and many Muslims are also being persecuted. Moderate Muslims are being persecuted. But I think you need almost our government to be able to speak out and put pressure on and do something because if we don't, there isn't anything else. And there's a saying, so goes Nigeria, so goes the whole Lake Chad region. That's Niger, Chad, right. Burkina right. Faso. Yeah. And so I think we should have somebody that goes over and sits with the Bahari government and say, this is what we believe in. I think that person who's a humanist ought to have every right. Somebody who's a Muslim, somebody who's Catholic, somebody who's Protestant. But right now, People are living in fear, particularly in the northern part and the middle belt. But even the terrorist activities are taking place now in, in the south. But I think by having President Biden and Secretary Blinken put this person in, I think can make all the difference in the world. So earlier in the our first question, earlier in the discussion, you mentioned a podcast in regards to the situation around. What is the name of that? Uh, if, you, if you just uh, Google you, sir. US, U.S. Commission, C, USC, International Religious Freedom, you, you, you serve podcast, uh, I, I ran, it's a half an hour, it explains what's going on, and they interview some people, and I think it's very ed educational. I'm a, I, I, I learned by hearing as much as by reading, and I found it very, very, very in interesting, but it's easy to find, to, to, to find, and I can, if, if you can, I can give Doug the you know the uh, the telephone number and you can you can call and, and email, but it's worth it's it's worth listening to. I, I will uh, echo that and say that I would encourage you to go to the USERF webpage. Um, they put out a annual report. Uh, they also put out specific country reports, right. and then they have a series of blogs and and podcasts that look at. Uh, contemporary, you know, uh, news items of the day, if you will. It, it was, I spent three or four hours hanging okay, around there. Good. Well, thank you. And um, Maybe you should be appointed. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. That's it, good. It was very nice. 
So our other question so far, um, and I encourage you to come up with a question, uh, practically or legally speaking, and I'm going to ask you to answer this. I, I mean, I this this is I actually said this, but I'm going to ask you to answer it, and then I'll actually chime in. Practically or legally speaking, what does the distinction between tolerance and respect for conscience look like? Tolerance just says we're going to we don't agree with you, but we're going to tolerate you. We're going to let you do it. We're going to watch you, but we're going to tolerate it. I think one of the most profound statements is the statement by uh, Madison, who was very close to, to uh, President uh, Washington. He says, conscience is the most sacred of all property. Conscience allows me to do whatever I want to do. My conscience has taken me places in Congress at times that it was very, very uncomfortable. But my conscience, it, 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 was, it was my conscience. My favorite movie is uh, A Man From All Seasons. Thomas, Thomas, Thomas More. I've seen that movie. There's two of my grandkids here. They can say, I've seen that movie time after time after time. I presume they have too. Every, I mean, in my family, Thomas More. I've, I've been to England. I went to the tower where Thomas More. I admire Thomas More. Conscious is I can do whatever I want to. And I don't want to infer I could. It was a big conscious issue that I faced in Congress that really, but it was not toleration. It was conscious. I just had to do what I had to do because at the end of my life, I believe that I'm going to have to answer it. So, and when your conscience gets you, it's, it's so that's a big difference. Toleration says you can do it, but conscience says you can do whatever you want to do. And, and, the, and the, the, the passage in there in, in uh, George Washington said, was it was my favorite where you sit on your vine, a fig tree, it, uh, you do whatever you want to do. You, whatever you want to do, your beliefs, you follow your conscience. And if you look again, Madison said, Conscience is the most sacred of all property, and it is conscience, conscience, conscience. And the men from all seasons, uh, the book is a great book. It's conscience. And Thomas More did what his conscience told him, and not what popularity said he should have done. So I would, I echo, I'm going to echo mostly what he, what uh, the congressman said. But the way I would put it would be, toleration is something that can be taken back. Mm -hmm. So you might start out in a country where we're going to tolerate Jewish Americans or Catholic Americans or Protestant Americans, and then it switches to where we're going to become intolerant. And America has done that. I mean, let's not forget we burned co uh, convents in the 1830s. We uh, were, have had a long, long standing anti-Semitic strain in, in, uh, in our politics. And so tolerance is that conscience is that idea that it is part of, I thought, I thought Washington said it extraordinarily well, conscience is that thing where it is just true. It's not going to change. It's immutable instead of being tolerance, which can change any moment. And it, it's, it's a much stronger way of imagining freedom than tolerance is. And so uh, that's how I would do that. And I think the words in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, endowed by their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's, 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 and I think as President Washington, uh, the Declaration of Independence was the covenant that really kind of sets everything up all around the world as well as in our own country. So a quick uh, comment, which uh, is very true in my life, Many of uh, my Iranian friends prefer to be called Persians. And in my classes, this is a, this is a reality that most, most of my Iranian students are Persians, they're not Iranians. And so that's just for those who aren't aware of that. Uh, the other question is um, more complicated, and that is religious freedom versus freedom of speech. In Sweden, the Koran was burnt by a man who got police protection in the name of freedom of speech. What do we call that? I myself, this person says, it is surprising religious freedom. Well, the burning Quran or burn a Bible would be hate speech, I think. I think that would be just, just that would be hateful. Yeah. That's, that's not a, a, a freedom of speech issue. 
freedom of speech issue if you want to demonstrate and you want to sit down and be willing to be arrested or if you want to pick at something. But I think uh, to, to, to burn the Koran or to burn the Bible is, is not freedom of speech. I think it's a hate. I, I think it's, a, it's an extraordinarily blurry line in there that is very difficult for us to understand. I mean, I, mean, I actually agree with you. But um, it's a blurry line. How how far can I go in expressing my freedom of conscience? And when does that bump up to the other freedoms of conscience that surround me? And I think that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. I think we should leave it there. Let's go have a drink. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Really nice. Really well done. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Congressman Wolf and David Sloan. Thank you so much for that. I also want to make sure we thank the donor who made our film possible, Irv Schwartz, who's, uh, oh, sorry, Irv Chase. That's a different man entirely. <laughs> Irv Chase from uh, Long Beach, California. Wonderful supporter of Mount Vernon. Without him, we couldn't have done this. And I also wanted to particularly call out a friend of Mount Vernon who's here tonight. Uh, where is the Reverend Lynn Rinaldi? He, she's the rector of Poet Church, George Washington's church. There's Reverend Lynn right there. Thank you for coming out tonight as well. And let's do what David suggested and all have a drink. Thank you.